I'm really uh, very happy to discuss innovative approaches to carbon markets with uh, relevant players in India again. Uh, so I'll give now a short introduction into carbon trading in Europe, the European trading scheme as a compliance market. Of course, we'll then further come to the voluntary markets and the issues of how to calculate greenhouse gas emission reductions. But let's first start with a pillar of European uh, uh, carbon markets. So the European trading scheme is covering all the EU member states and also three further states, uh, small states uh, that are not members of the European Union. The market was introduced in the year 2005, so now has 15 years of history and it's already in its third phase. It currently covers the power sector, the industry sector and domestic aviation. So of course it's very relevant uh, to the sectors that are overseen by BE and Ministry of Power. It covers um, uh, three categories of greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxides and PFCs. About 11,000 industrial and power generation installations are covered. Uh, so it really has a wide reach. There are two generic methods of allocating the emission allowances under the system. One is auctioning, one is free allocation. I'll get into some details on that. Just in orders of the magnitude, it covers almost 2 billion ton of CO2 equivalent. Um, so really significant on a worldwide scale. It is also important because it was the first system that actually allowed uh, so-called international offsets. And this is a component that will be very relevant for the discussion of carbon markets in the Indian context, because essentially that was one of the driving forces of the rise of India as a clean development mechanism project developer. Um, the price that we currently see in this market um, is relatively high. I come back to that at a later point, how it developed over time. Of course, the current COVID crisis has impacted on the price, but much less than many people would have expected. So yesterday's price was around 23 euros per ton of CO2 equivalent. And what is also important, one should note, that of course the EU has a very strong and long-term greenhouse gas reduction target under the Paris Agreement and it sees the emission trading scheme as key approach to actually work towards these targets. You may have heard about the Green Deal that was announced last December. Now of course in the context of the COVID recovery uh, the Green Deal is being discussed to a large extent and it's good to see that there are many people and also decision makers who say the Green Deal should be strengthened uh, in the context of COVID recovery. Um, so just to now move on, uh, we, as I said, have the power sector. The system covers all installations that are larger than 20 megawatt thermal rated input. Uh, for the industry, we have various thresholds. There is a very elaborate system I'll come to later that relates to the so-called emissions benchmarks. And we have the aviation sector where we have uh, thresholds that are comparable, but a bit lower than for the industry sector. And now here you see the overall emission cap. Uh, as I said, there are three phases. The first phase uh, defined the cap according to a bottom-up procedure from all member states, but then the European Commission felt that this process is cumbersome and also doesn't lead to the environmental outcome that would be desired. So for the second phase, the European Commission took over uh, the allocation. You see there is a significant drop of the cap between 2007 and 2008. Um, and then from 2012 onwards, in the third phase, we have a linear decline of the cap. And now for the fourth phase that will kick in after this year, this downward path is steepening. You also see the small green element, which is the aviation cap that was uh, added to the insulation cap. 
Here you see the price development. This market has been very dynamic. It started with very high prices. Actually, here I have the prices of the bankable allowances. In the first pilot phase, there were allowances that could not be banked that had a very high price in the year 2005, but then the price fell to zero as it became clear that there was an over allocation. So there was uh, too much allowances on the market compared to the demand. In 2008, of course, you know that there was a big financial and economic crisis that led to significant reductions of industrial production in the EU. So, of course, that also led to downward pressure on the price of the EU allowances, falling from about 30 euros to less than 10. Then the price remained relatively stable until around 2011. Um, and then it, uh, it got onto a downward trend. Why was that? The first aspect of the downward trend was that after 2011, the prices of the certified emission reductions under the clean development mechanism fell significantly. And as the certified emission reductions could be used within the European trading scheme, of course, up to a certain uh, upper threshold, but at that time, this threshold was not reached. Uh, of course, it meant that uh, the, there was a price pressure on the allowance and that explains this uh, reduction from around 15 to around 7 euros. And then, of course, the price pressure went on after the problems we had with overcoming the Copenhagen situation and coming towards a new international climate policy regime. So one sees that after the low of about uh, €3.50 reached in 2013, we had a slow increase of the price again. That was linked to the fact that this import limit for the certified emission reductions was reached around 2015. Um, but then again, even after the Paris Agreement had been agreed, the price fell again because there was still a surplus in the market. And then you see the sudden increase of prices after 2017. Why is that? It is because the market was uh, changing in one very important aspect because uh, yeah, the policymakers felt that uh, there is this uh, long-term surplus that is keeping prices down and the market should actually fulfill again its function of increasing the environmental ambition of the EU. So they introduced what was called a market stability reserve. This is relatively complicated. I will not go into detail, but essentially it means that in times of surplus on the market that is defined according to certain parameters, allowances will be taken away from the market. And this was decided in 2017 and therefore the market players knew that the surplus would not persist in the long term and that led to a significant price increase reaching the value of almost 30 euros last year. You also see that the variability has increased which of course is due to the issues related to the overall development of climate policy in the EU. There's a lot of discussion about whether the 2030 nationally determined contribution should be strengthened or not. I mentioned the Green Deal and then of course the Covid crisis. So uh, one can say that uh, after a long period where the system did not really generate a significant incentive for greenhouse gas reduction because the price was low, now in the last two years this has changed and it has led to significant impacts on the emissions, for example in the power sector. Actually, coal power generation has reduced by 40% uh, year on year basis. Of course, some of it is linked to the COVID crisis, but uh, a lot of the impact is due to the high price of the allowances on the market. Um, here I show the principal approach with regard to the emission cap on the national level. Uh, so here you see, of course, power sector, industry sector, transport sector. This is now just a, a fictitious example. It is not showing the exact allocation process in the EU ETS because that is quite complicated. But um, this is just to show 
that, of course, in the case of the UTS, where only certain sectors of the economy are covered, one needs also to deal with the other sectors and uh, the so-called non-ETS sectors in the EU. Now, of course, one of the key aspects uh, that is important for policymakers and also the private sector, those who are covered by the system, is the question how the allocation to insulation is being done. The initial approach was the so-called grandfathering. So all the installations and companies set up their historical emissions data, and that was a process that took some time before the system could actually be launched in 2005. There was, for example, the discussion about so-called early action, showed companies who before the introduction of the system uh, had reduced their emissions, should they get special treatment? Uh, then the question would be, is there a longer term reference period or only uh, one single year base year? And then, of course, the question whether one would need to introduce a discount factor if it's clear uh, that uh, the total of uh, historical emissions cannot be covered. Because, yeah, you want to reduce emissions overall. That means, of course, you cannot just give the historical quantity to everyone. Um, the grandfathering was the predominant allocation mode in the pilot phase uh, between 2005 and 2007 and uh, was replaced uh, only then in the subsequent phases. And now the second allocation option, the so-called benchmarking comes in. Benchmarking means one looks at certain technologies and this can become relatively complicated. For example, for refineries, the benchmarks are extremely complex. Of course, for other industrial sectors like cement and steel production, they are easier to determine. Uh, and then companies would get an allocation that is consistent with that benchmark. That, of course, means that the highly efficient installations may even get more allowances than they would actually need from the historical emissions, depending where the benchmark is located. But uh, the laggards would, of course, get less. And that means the laggards then need to purchase additional allowances. Um, and now there is more than 50 benchmarks in the UETS. So that means it requires a significant amount of uh, yeah, technical, technical work to decide which is the degree of disaggregation of technologies for the benchmarking. But of course, now more than a decade of experience show that it can be done. And the third allocation approach, and this is the approach that will dominate in the future, is the so-called auctioning. So it means that there will not be any free allocation, but that all the allowances need to be acquired uh, through the auction or through buying from other players in the market. That is currently the case for the power sector in most EU countries. There are still some exemptions for the new member states in the East. Um, and of course, uh, what should be also clarified is that so far, far auctioning is not being applied to sectors that are subject to international competition. There are certain parameters that determine how the exposure to international competition is being calculated, but it means that most of the widely tradable goods like aluminium, like steel, that those sectors are actually not subject to auctioning. So this relates to the allocation. Here, as I mentioned, the benchmarking, and I know that this, of course, is of particular interest how this could be done. So we have the 52 product, product benchmarks and then so-called fallback approaches where you have specific uh, products that are either too small or yeah, too heterogeneous uh, to actually justify a specific benchmark. They can then apply the fallback approaches. Uh, the general approach to benchmarking is to look at the 10% uh, best performing technology for the specific category. And uh, on the right hand side, the graph shows you how these benchmarks are being developed. Uh, so 
that you, of course, have a lot of interaction with stakeholders with regard to uh, draft and the methodology for data collection. Then there will be a specific approach how to do the rule book uh, for data collection that is being validated, then the data are collected. There needs to be a verification, of course, of these data. This is very important. Um, and then eventually the benchmarks will be published. Um, now, of course, we have the critical question of enforcement, and I want to really uh, push this issue because we've seen globally that uh, emission trading systems that are not seeing good enforcement don't work properly. For example, in China, in some of the provincial trading schemes, there is no proper enforcement and the prices have been very low. Also, liquidity of the systems has been very low. So I think one of the real successes of the EU ETS was that from the start, it had a very strict enforcement and penalty system. So I showed you the prices. So in the first phase, so the pilot phase, the penalty was 40 euro per ton of CO2 of that was not covered by an allowance. And of course, even once you had paid the penalty, you would still have to submit the missing allowances. The penalty level was significantly increased from phase two onwards, so it's way above the market price even after the recent rise. And of course, there will also be naming and shaming. So those companies who don't comply, uh, the names will be publicized. Uh, now I want to get into the linking with the offset credit um, schemes. The clean development mechanism, I already mentioned it. Initially, there was unlimited quantitative use. Then for the second phase, there were quantitative restrictions. So each member state could uh, differentiate them. Germany, for example, allowed a relatively high role for CDM credits. Mm, and then uh, since the third phase now, we have restrictions. So there was limitation of the projects coming in. I'm getting uh, feedback. Okay, I hope it works now better. Uh, so uh, that uh, new projects that were registered and not located in least developed countries would no longer be eligible and also certain project types, the so-called industrial gases would not be uh, eligible. And now uh, the limit, which is about 1.6 billion credits has been reached and the EU so far doesn't foresee a new acceptance of offset credits. Uh, of course, there are discussions about the role of Article 6, so one needs to see how this develops and maybe if the nationally determined contribution for 2030 is strengthened, there might again be a role for carbon, international carbon credits. Yeah, uh, just uh, before I close this part of the this presentation, I want to look at the ecosystem of service providers uh, that relate to the European trading scheme. So, of course, we have those, I start on the lower left end, we have those who actually provide services for trading. So these are registries. For example, each member state <coughs> has a specific registry. And then there are the banks and brokers who actually mobilize um, the transactions. Then if we continue to the upper left, uh, we have the consultancies and project developers that bring in credits from projects if credits are allowed. Then on the upper right, we have those who actually verify, uh, so the verifiers and uh, also be beyond the verifiers, we have entities that may support the development of the standards. And then, of course, the lower right side, very important for the trading scheme, those who buy, so the operators that are covered, sometimes also speculators. So with that, I would like to give back